a foot of snow on the ground already. Uh, Toya Joyce, you can actually see it's almost up to my knee. I'd say there's a solid 16 inches on the ground here in Spooner. Between Rice Lake and Spooner, about six tractor trailers that were off the road on Highway 53. The main roads are still in rough shape. The salt trucks and plows having a tough time keeping up between 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. That's when snowfall rates reach two inches per hour. We arrived into town around 3 o'clock as the snowfall rates started to taper off a little bit. Uh, residents were shocked at just how quickly and hard it came down during the late morning, early afternoon. Schools closed at one o'clock. Area businesses also shutting down. The credit union was closing about two hours early. You couldn't even see when you were driving. It was terrible. We had to put sunglasses on so we could see where we were driving. Big snow day yesterday. In fact, a record amount for us in St. Cloud. 13.2 inches for November 10th, day before Veterans Day, and 4.3 inches was the previous back in 1946. And from early this morning, you can still see some snow flying at the St. Cloud State University campus. Uh, Duluth, Minnesota picking up 4.7. This is just through yesterday now, not including what we've picked up so far today. Minneapolis Airport, 2.6. Well, Claire, Wisconsin, 1.4. Rochester, Minnesota, just a trace in International Falls, a trace. But here's some of the highest tallies that I could find. St. Augustine, Cambridge, actually picking up 16 and a half inches of snow. Hughes in the Denver Post newsroom with the top stories from DPTV. So how does this make you feel? The cold snap in Denver is making Alaska feel balmy today. We're in single digits here in Denver and they hit 41 degrees in Anchorage today. Forecasters say we are on track to break a record for the coldest temperature on this date. The prediction was that we would hit 8 degrees in Denver, but so far the official temperature out of the airport has only reached half of that. And overnight lows are forecasted to stay in single digits. By the way, the standing record for a low high on this date is 9 degrees set back in 1916. This out. People capturing images of these fireballs streaking across the horizon. So what's going on here? ABC's Michelle Franzen explains. Barreling through the night sky over San Antonio, multiple sightings of mysterious fireballs and loud booms. We had an explosion here on 57. Take a look at this. Guy and Karen Parker were driving when they captured this bright streak on camera. It was a real bright green kind of fireball looking object in the sky. That big burning glow also caught on the dash cam of one local police officer out on patrol. Police say they received at least 150 reports of a bright fireball zipping across the horizon from Houston to Dallas and down to San Antonio. It looked like it was across, like it went towards uh, Mexico. Just like the blazing sky, sightings lit up Twitterverse, too. Scientists need to confirm if those streaks are from a meteor. So for now, there is still a trail of mystery.
Tonight, people up near the Oregon border are waiting for the ground to move again. A swarm of earthquakes has hit the area for months. So we asked Paul to find out what this really means. Paul? If you have an earthquake app, it means that you're looking down every hour saying, wow, another earthquake in the same spot. So what makes a swarm? Is it 50? Is it 100? Is it 200? Since July, more than 550 earthquakes in this one spot, and 150 of those in the past week. It's right where Oregon, California, and Nevada come together. It's northwestern Nevada, about 40 miles away from Lakeview, Oregon. Uh, they have had a tremendous amount of earthquake activity recently, and that has seismologists curious. They say that there is a slight increase of a much larger earthquake happening in that spot because of this swarm. On a dark Texas night, Patty checks in on her trap. Here along the U.S.-Mexico border, she's looking for kissing bugs, blood-sucking insects that transmit Chagas disease. Her bait? 
ultraviolet light and a vapor of dry ice. The ice, the dry ice, make the carbon dioxide that we need to attract the bugs. It's carbon dioxide that the bug uses to find its prey, tracking the exhalations of rats, dogs, and people, then hiding out where they live, usually in poverty-stricken areas. Conditions for the house is usually not electricity, no good drainage, and the, the doors are open, and there are some holes in the houses where they can go, or if you have dogs, and the dog has a house, then those are good conditions for them. The insect earned the moniker kissing bug because it infects with a kiss. So come close to your mouth, kiss you, or get your blood, you don't feel it. And then they have to poo. In the feces is when parasite comes. So next morning you scratch and the parasite goes into your system. The parasite can cause organs like the intestines or the heart to expand until they burst. More than 20,000 people die from it each year. It's a well-known disease in Latin America. In Texas, where one out of five people lives below the poverty line, more than 200,000 people are believed to be infected. Patty says she expects infections to spread as climate change brings kissing bugs further north.
Well, there's word that hackers with ties to the Russian government have made their way into the software that runs a good chunk of our nation's critical infrastructure. Great news. According to the reporting of ABC News, which came out with this first, the Fed say this could cause an economic catastrophe. The Department of Homeland Security now reports the bug has been in play at least since 2011. But officials supposedly have no idea when the hackers might activate it and potentially cause some real damage. So it's just sitting in there waiting for activation. Analysts say just about every type of critical system is at risk. Energy, water, banking, transportation, the list is long. And ABC cites national security sources who say there's evidence Russia backed the entire thing. Not just some Russian oligarchs or rich people, the Russian government. Those sources do not think it's a random attack at all, but that the Russians are taking a page from the Cold War playbook and they're calling it a very serious threat. The first Muslim prayer service to ever take place at Washington National Cathedral. For we approach the same God, whose desire for our world is salam, shalom, peace. You are so very welcome. Well, I think it really symbolizes how far we've come. Respecting differences, that's what has strengthened America, and uh, it will make us stronger. The Episcopal Allah Cathedral's Akbar. decision to host Muslim Friday prayers, or Juma, sparked a heated conversation on social media. The Reverend Billy Graham's son, Franklin, posted on Facebook, It's sad to see a church open its doors to the worship of anything other than the one true God of the Bible. Graham's full post is in our story on NBCWashington.com. News 4 viewer Debbie writes, I just cannot understand this. Would they allow a Christian prayer service in a mosque? Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. A protester briefly interrupted the start of the service. She was quickly led away. Thanks and glory be to Allah. The South African ambassador offered the sermon condemning Islamic extremism. But we believe that the cathedral should be also used for other faith communities because we're a, a national cathedral. The National Cathedral would like to hold interfaith prayer services like this one on a regular basis. They plan to reach out to various faiths and invite them in. At the National Cathedral, Kristen Wright, News 4.
California shopper says that she was tired of hearing a kid throw a temper tantrum, so she asked the child's mom to quiet her down, and this is what happened. And next thing I know, she hits me in the mouth with her fist, or shoves me to the ground, and then hits me again. Well, the whole thing caught on surveillance cameras. The mom's the one wearing the red shirt, followed the woman to the car, and decked her in retaliation. Police still trying to track down that angry mom. If you murder enough of your wives, they will eventually put you behind bars. Not saying that's what happened, but we'll report you decide. A man in Colorado faces murder charges now after prosecutors say he may have pushed his second wife off a cliff several years after a car crash uh, killed his first wife. Back in 2012, investigators say Harold and Tony Henthorn went hiking at Rocky Mountain National Park. We covered this story extensively at the time. They went there to celebrate their 12th wedding anniversary. It was supposed to be awesome. And that's when the wife, quote, fell, unquote, about 50 feet off a cliff and died right there. Her husband reportedly said she was trying to take a picture along the ledge there, but investigators say somebody may have pushed her. In fact, that's what they believe. Prosecutors now say he pushed her and he killed her and he did it on purpose. According to court documents, the wife had taken out three life insurance policies totaling four and a half million dollars. Now back to the first wife, who died more than a decade earlier in 1995. She and the husband reportedly got a flat tire while driving along a back road. Here's the question part. Investigators say she was underneath the car helping change the tire, which gets you kicked out of the good husband club in the first place, and that the jack that held the car slipped somehow and caused her death. Now think about it. One slipped off a, off a ledge, the other had a car, jack, a car slip onto her. The sheriff's office report, it has reopened that first dead wife investigation.
The internet is an ugly place right now for broadband providers. Shares of Comcast, Time Warner Cable and others were slammed after President Obama took the unusual step of trying to set policy for an independent government agency and came out strongly against broadband's ability to charge more for faster service. The president detailed his position in a video statement. Internet providers have a legal obligation not to block or limit your access to a website. Cable companies can't decide which online stores you can shop at or which streaming services you can use. And they can't let any company pay for priority over its competitors. It all comes down to an issue called net neutrality, the idea that all internet traffic should be treated equally by providers, which are mainly cable companies. The Federal Communications Commission, or FCC, is currently deciding whether some sites that may want their content to move more smoothly, Netflix is often used as an example, can pay more for what is essentially a faster lane. Obama is saying no and that the companies should in fact be regulated much like utilities. Reuters correspondent Alina Selyuk. This is a really big deal for the cable companies and investors because this really bodes um, poorly for the light touch regulatory approach that they were hoping for um, as the FCC says these new net neutrality rules. It really raises the stakes for the FCC to set stricter rules and stricter rules um, inevitably mean higher legal costs and potential kind of complicated matters trying to resolve with the government.